normal life uh, for the rest of us. Um, let me figure out how to. Okay. And I don't need to put that in the presentation. Good. Um, well, Andy asked me to, to, he said, hey, we were having coffee. You've done a, a bunch of uh, little exits. You should talk about that. And so I thought, you know, the topic is kind of an interesting one because you do just hear about the people going for, you know, multi-billion dollar kind of you know, uh, rocket shots, which are, you know, they're out there, but they're pretty small in number. And it's, uh, the, you know, my experience has been that there's a very robust market particularly under 50 million, but uh, sub $100 million exits. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are actually looking to do acquisitions to add to their capabilities, even down at the about the $10 million level in terms of uh, revenues uh, for companies. And uh, doing that, you can focus on solving a problem, building it to a critical mass, getting it to a point where you really do need extra resources and assistance, and those paths can be very positive. Uh, for you and for the for the acquirers. So I want to talk about that a little bit. The other th thought that I had around the topic was, you know, if you're going to go try and build a billion dollar business, um, normally you need a lot of capital to do that. And that capital always comes with strings. Not everybody wants those strings. So I found this quote from somebody who said, you know, I, I don't want to be a unicorn, I want to be a horse. And you kind of go, what the hell is a horse? Well, a horse uh, gets fed, it's real, you know, it's out there working every day. A uh, unicorn is an imaginary creature. There's a reason why they picked the name unicorn, because they're pretty damn rare. Um, and to become a unicorn, you're probably going to go take a significant amount of venture capital uh, funds. Not that there's anything wrong with venture capital firms. Lots of them are great. I work with some that are, that are awesome to work with. But, you know, you, you go into the venture capital world and you get into a bunch of stuff you better learn about in terms of preferences and you know special dealings within the offer that they that they take, which essentially eliminates their downside risk unless you completely wipe out. Um, there's lots of businesses that do fine, and they do fine because they find a problem, they focus on solving that problem, they look in, in uh, areas where there are two things they can do in particular. Where is there a big addressable market and where can I go get customers I can hang on to? And a lot of acquirers are really looking for those two things. Have you started something that has the opportunity to grow into something larger with the right resources put against it? Uh, and are your customers sticky? Do they like what you're doing? Do they stay with your product? Um, I just grabbed this from a McKinsey study, and this really shows you the very top of the pyramid because these are all public software companies since 1980. And I'm not going to go into all the details of the chart, but as you can see, to get to 100 million in revenue is a very small number. Since 1980, the ones that went public, it was under 1,000. To get to a billion, it was 100. To get to more than 4 billion in revenue, it was 19 uh, over a 23-year period of time. So it's not the norm. Uh, there's lots of problems that we can solve as uh, business people that uh, have much you know, much smaller kind of uh, markets associated with them as we build out that solution or are part of a much larger solution that you can fold into. Um, good, I'm not seeing the same thing, but uh, interestingly enough, if you're gonna go for a unicorn, you're also gonna tend to go to a larger VC firm because uh, they're the ones that have the resources to be able to put tens of millions of dollars into, into a business. But what you find is Smaller VCs, which tend to focus uh, more on smaller uh, kind of investments, tend to do better. And what this is measuring is uh, public market equivalent performance. So anything above one is good. Anything below one is not so good. And what you can see is good is over here. Once you go to larger firms also, what you find is liquidation preference is a term that I'm sure many out here are familiar with. Uh, might be 1x if you're lucky, might be 2x, might have uh, warrant kickers, might have all sorts of other terms associated with it. What it really translates into is whatever money your, your business makes when you sell it, I get it first. And until I get what I want, you don't get anything. That's, that's what liquidation preference means. And that's also going to be your experience as you try to raise you know, larger and larger sums of money. You're going to run into that. So you have to have huge exits if you start taking significant amounts of money. So 
But another, another slide I, or chart I found, smaller funds actually tend to perform better in terms of returning money to their investors. And so you would think, you know, you'd see more of these growing. A third of the time, their investments are uh, not returning what was given to them, but two thirds of the time they're returning that and more versus larger funds, it's half and half. Kind of an interesting and surprising result, uh, I thought. And the other thing that I've heard a lot of people talk about is, you, you know, you personally don't want to put a lot of your money into venture capital. It hasn't done that well over the years. This is the upper quartile IRR since uh, 81 and the, the uh, lower quartile IRR. You can see the bottom quartile actually just lost money for at least the last 10 years. So you kind of wonder, okay, what, what does that mean for venture capital firms? And uh, I guess that's why a bunch of them have gone out of business. Um, so strings attached, performance issues, uh, and then the last thing is, you know, anytime you're raising money to build your business, you have to think about, you know, what's the bang for the buck that you're getting? Um, your time is the most precious thing in the world, not somebody else's money. That money can go a million places and probably will. It probably goes to your competitors. Some of the most successful VCs I personally have known got there by figuring out that a particular market was interesting and then they'd spread their bets across six or eight or 10 companies in that space. Um, if you look at the statistics, and these are from uh, exit round, at the low end, companies raising two or $3 million, which is not a lot of money, um, a lot of money if you're an individual, but for, for a venture capital firm, not a lot of money, exiting at around 20 million on, in, at the median which means they're netting about 17, assuming a 1x preference, that you know the first uh, three million goes back to the VC. You look at the same number over here when you raise $10 million or more, the median exit is around 27, the math worked. Um, so you end up 17 million net as your best case. So interestingly enough, the statistics show smaller raises, smaller exits is, uh, is frankly also more rewarding for the, uh, for the founders of companies uh, and for the people who are you know, holding uh, management equity. What you hear about though is big exits. That's where the news stories go. This is TechCrunch data. Um, they say the, the average successfully acquired startup, so that means a company that's grown to an exit and they've, they've tracked that acquisition, which means it had to be public and the information had to be public enough that they could put numbers against it, raised 30 million and sold for 155. But in reality, they're missing out on most of these deals down here, which don't get reported. You know, if you're not material uh, or you're bought by a private company, nobody's ever gonna hear about a lot of these deals. I'll show you the ones I've been involved with. I'm sure you haven't heard of them. Um, and in fact, when you talk to people in the industry, uh, Mark Sister is a pretty well-known blogger um, and uh, investor in the space. Uh, he talks about the median exit being closer to 70 million. Um, and if you go into exit round data, you find that almost two thirds of deals are less than 10 million of the ones that they're tracking. So they're, they're finding a way to track those small deals. And the vast majority of them happen below 100 million. But there's nothing wrong with that. It really comes down to how much time, how much money, did you solve a problem? Did you create something interesting that then gets folded into you know, a larger solution that continues the work that you started and has the impact on the marketplace that you were looking for. These are my personal experiences. Uh, Quivix Systems, um, I was talking to somebody about um, starting in boring businesses. Quivix Systems was one of those. It was workflow management software for the insurance industry. The insurance industry had a huge problem that uh, essentially every step of the claims process uh, from the moment you get in an accident is outsourced to somebody and those, those somebodies not only tend to do their jobs badly, but they tend to be really poor at communicating with each other, so we're trying to solve that problem. Big problem, a lot of value in terms of uh, helping reduce churn rates for insurance companies as well as being able to cut a huge amount of costs uh, because of the time it takes uh, in the collision repair process. You know, we were targeting trying to cut it from 60 days on average down to 30. You can imagine how much savings that would yield. Bad timing. 
Um, this was in 2001. Uh, we ended up selling this business because we couldn't raise money uh, in the spring of 2001. So we sold it to a, uh, if, if anyone knows the industry, Safe Light uh, provides glass, auto glass. Um, and they wanted it because it was a way to um, <clears throat> take control of claims. Once you own the claim, then you start parceling it out to all the other players in the industry and you have a way of, of uh, making sure that you're in the mix to, uh, to earn money. I spent a year there. It was a spin out from another company a year prior to that. So the good news was it was a very, very, I, I don't even want to call it a modest success. It was a, a very modest non-failure. <laughs> um, the investors got their money back. Um, they put in three million, they got enough back to cover it. I, I made a little bit of money and I had a valuable lesson, with one of which was, uh, it was my first experience with an early stage technology company. Uh, I relied on other people who told me, oh, don't worry, uh, we've got, you know, there were three big funds back in this business. They all had tons of capital. We're putting our money into this business. Well, yeah, the money doesn't come until it's in, you know, when it's in the bank, then you know it came. Prior to that, you don't know anything, and they decided they wanted somebody else to invest, and timing, and so on and so forth. You have to kind of control that yourself. And then you start learning the lesson about how uh, how precious cash is, and how, you know, when you're running a small business or a startup, you've got to really focus on managing your cash, and keeping yourself from approaching that cliff where, oh, I'm, I'm down to, I have three to six months worth of money left. I found myself in a position where I had three months of money left when my um, backers finally said, "Yeah, you know, we're just we're gonna we're gonna have you go find somebody else." And you're like, "Yeah, I'm gonna raise money in 90 days in this market? I don't think so." Um, so instead, I had to figure out how am I gonna sell this thing in 90 days, which is a pretty big challenge too. Um, I then got lucky uh, and stumbled into uh, Overture well after it was successful and had IPO'd. I don't know how, how much went in, 25 million I know was, was put in prior to the IPO. How much ultimately was invested is probably a huge number. A, a nice exit, um, that's probably the closest I've ever come to a unicorn. I was there for the last two years of that. It was a fun time, uh, did a lot of acquisitions and built new businesses. Um, but I like getting back into the small stuff. So the next thing I did was uh, a, a little company called Nevin Vision, which did machine vision technology. Um, it was a classic story. Uh, there was a founder who was a scientist who was passionate about his, what he had created. He had awesome technology. It was probably one of the top two or three uh, face and facial recognition technologies in the world. Um, but he was clueless about how to turn that into a product. And he was even more clueless about how to take that to market. He had founded a company and taken it into bankruptcy in five years. And then um, some people that I knew at, at Anthem had bought it out of bankruptcy, uh, got the assets and, and the IPO uh, portfolio for a pretty good price. They had then let him continue to run it and he was about to run it into bankruptcy again. When they asked me to come join and say, Hell, you know, this guy has, uh, when I first met this guy, he showed me the 30 or 40 different things you could do with his technology. It was great. You could, you could uh, you know, practically have it manage your life. But every one of those things was not even fully prototyped. And he was out trying to make a living selling software development kits. So he would go to Nissan and say, hey, use this for gaze detection for drivers, and you can have a, a, the first car with a feature that uh, detects somebody falling asleep at the wheel and wakes them up. Cool, how much am I gonna pay you for that idea that I now have to go take your software development kit, figure out how to build the application layer, how to build that into my hardware, you know, not very much. Um, he had done a great job of building out a, a security biometrics uh, uh, prototype, which was actually being tested uh, by the uh, military in, in uh, Afghanistan and was also being tested by the LAPD and their gang task force. And it was a little hardware unit that he actually went all the way to, to creating a prototype that essentially could recognize people from a database. And you can imagine if you're in a gang task force, there's lots of gang members who don't necessarily get processed through the system 
but if you're taking pictures of people as you catch them in bad behavior, and then they go into database, you now have the ability to recognize people in the field, because obviously no one's carrying around ID or willing to share their real name and so on and so forth. So that, that's pretty useful. If you're in Afghanistan and you're hiring local people to help you with running a base, you might not know everybody really well, so it would be useful to be able to recognize, yes, that in fact is, and I'm not going to use a name because I don't know what the right names to use would be, it would sound a little bit uh, something, it would sound bad. Um, that's the guy that I hired yesterday, uh, or the, the woman that I hired yesterday. Um, so that those things were very useful. What in the world was a modestly funded startup doing in that business? Who are you selling to? You're selling to mostly to government. What does government do? Government asks you to run pilot programs and proof of concept for years. How much do those cost? Millions. When do you get a contract? Maybe a decade from now. So bad business for us to be in, but a very interesting product that he developed. So we immediately started looking for a buyer for that because it was prototyped enough that we could approach you know, the two leaders in the uh, biometric uh, space at the time were uh, Cogent and uh, Motorola who were doing fingerprint um, uh, software and basically started a conversation with them. The other things that, that were interesting were it, it was very good at figuring out how to do recognition in very little computing space. So it would, you know, one of the things he really focused on was leveraging mobile before mobile was really available. And part, partially probably because he was German and, and Europe was way ahead of the US at the time in mobile. And he had the ability to, he developed this uh, capability that on a mobile platform with a tiny amount of uh, computing capability, take a picture of something and you basically translate that into the equivalent of a digital fingerprint by understanding all the relationships between the spaces and shapes uh, uh, that you took a picture of, turn that into a little tiny file, which back then you really had to be tiny, because then you sent it somewhere to a server and back for an action on the phone. In those days, you know, this is not that long ago, 2006, but that was a 10 second trip. Um, and so, Actually, we thought we could build a business around it, and we started doing that. We built actually uh, started building a mobile advertising platform around that, where we were selling very high engagement marketing campaigns, mostly in Asia and Europe, because you could actually take advantage of their better um, uh, mobile technology for this to work out for people. And typical campaigns were uh, a German software company. That, uh, I'm sorry, uh, soft drink company was introducing some horrible beverage. <laughs> it was orange flavored licorice with, you know, five times the caffeine of coffee. <laughs> I think you were supposed to drink it, run around in circles and, you know, <laughs> headbutt a wall or something. But, um, so we ran a campaign for it. $250,000 a month for them to then, for people to basically take a picture of the, the label of this soft drink, we recognize it, we send people a, a little video game for their mobile platform. Uh, we did a campaign in Japan for a cosmetics company. And this was something we stumbled upon that was actually really valuable. Um, all of you, I'm sure, are very well aware of what's happened to print in the digital age. Uh, not so good, and in fact, if you look at, you know, at the time, I was looking at a typical uh, fashion magazine, and it looked a lot like what happened to the portal business online. You know, you open a magazine, and the first 100 pages are ads, and nobody looks at them. They, they're, you know, they're, they're worse than banner ads. They get no engagement, no, no motivation for people to, to remember a thing. That creates the opportunity to sell something where, you know, I now run a campaign, I'm a cosmetics company, I use six different models, you have to find my ad, take a picture of the model, we recognize it, once you've filled out your block of, you know, you've found all six models, I give you some reward. And it's, you know, some software program that goes back to your, to your cell phone. Sounds silly, sounds like there's a lot of people that wouldn't bother with that, but in terms of high engagement marketing, uh, the people who do engage with it, the people that, that talk about that, the extra coverage you get out of that, you know, people would pay a significant amount of, amount of money for that. So in the first year of, of building that, we, we went from zero to about six million in revenues uh, in about nine months. 
which you know felt good. At the same time, we heard a rumor that Google was looking for this kind of technology and was talking to the wrong people because they weren't as good as we were. Um, so we found a way to worm our way into Google, gave some presentations to them, talked about their existing products and what we could do, and uh, we ended up being bought by Google. Um, so, you know, that's where I, I use one of my, I, I do a lot of movie references and people ask me at the end, well, what did Google do with that? I said, well, have you ever seen the, uh, you know, the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Everybody's seen that, right? A scene at the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Google put, <laughs> Google put its best men on it. <laughs> Into the warehouse. Yes. Um, actually, it's not quite that bad. I discovered that, you know, once again, the world is not nearly as rational as I hope it is. Um, we went to Google and said, you just bought Android. This is before Android had been released. This would be perfect to go along with that. Android wanted, wanted to uh, bring our technology to their sphere. But Picasso was interested in our technology also because it had, as a hobby, the, the, the uh, CEO who had now become the CTO had developed a little program because he was struggling with how to manage all of his pictures on his cell phone. And so he built something that would allow him to do visual searches on his cell phone to go find a picture of his son with three friends where everybody had their eyes open. And Picasso liked that. So much to my surprise, rather than my solution was pay us more, leave us independent, and we'll build for both, they said, no, we're going to have a bake-off. Well, Android was busy. Picasso won. Picasso bought us. And it, to me, it was like the least valuable application of the technology. <laughs> but that's what they wanted. They, and they wanted the science. And they wanted the, the patent portfolio. They got it. You know, relatively modest exit. Um, and it, actually, more money had gone through a, sort of a B and a B1 round. Uh, more money had gone into it than probably should have given the stage of development because you shouldn't be getting B round until you have something you're ready to scale. Um, you know, you should be trying to use as little money as possible to build your product, prove that somebody wants it, get it to work in some application, and then when you start needing to go to market, you go get more money. But in any case, still, you know, very attractive for the investors. Um, Particularly the, the late stage investors got double their money in less than a year, the people who did the last round. Uh, everybody else got a larger multiple, so it, it was good. Um, NAMI is an example of a very small company that you would have said, you know, that's somebody's hobby uh, and it's probably not going to survive. Um, a million dollars of Pasadena Angels money had gone into it. Um, when I had when I came in, it had been kind of bumping along for about eight years. Um, we were able to kind of take it in a different direction, build out a, a platform technology that ran, um, basically allowed ad networks to run at the high volume, low price end of the PPC market, the pay-per-click market, um, and get you know ourselves noticed by a company called Lynn Media, which I had not heard of, who basically ran a bunch of uh, television stations in local markets and decided that they needed to diversify into digital media. And they had bought one of our customers, um, uh, a company called RMM down in uh, Texas that was in the display business. And they wanted to have a full portfolio of display, price per click, affiliate marketing, et cetera. So we were their second acquisition. And so that happened in 2011, stayed there a bit longer. Um, but the people who got in, everybody made, all of the investors made money. All of them beat what they could have gotten from public market investments. And the early invest uh, investors did really well in that because it, it was actually a pretty large multiple given how little money actually went into it. The, it was not fun to run a business where you had, you know, when I first joined, we had $150,000 in cash <laughs> on the balance sheet. And you're kind of looking at payroll and going, hmm, what <laughs> payrolls am I covering? <clears throat> Yikes. Um, but it's, you know, that kind of stress creates uh, creativity on your part of running a business to really make things work. You figure out how to use money where it really needs to be used and where you're wasting money, you, you stop doing that almost immediately. Um, and the last thing I was associated with, I was just on the board of a, of a small company called Thermark, uh, which was a momentum uh, investment. 
And the thesis didn't quite work out, but by being patient, by finding a different path, switching it from a direct sales model to a distributor sales model, where you could run it with an incredibly lean organization. Um, and when I mean lean, I mean, you know, probably no one remembers uh, Twiggy, so I don't know if that's a good reference. Uh, oh, yeah. Oil lean, you know, just lean. Um, <clears throat> I was on the board for the last five years. We just basically built cash, and there was one logical place to exit, which we ultimately exited to, and, and uh, got about an $8 million exit off of, I don't know if the full amount that was the best. It might be a little more than a million, but it was not, not a lot more. So it wasn't a home run, but these were all, that's why I think you see the bigger success rates for the smaller funds, because a big fund would have just shut this down and written it off. The small funds sort of stuck with it, figured out how to support the management team, um, and support that business and carry it to exit uh, that ultimately turned out to positively. So that's my personal experience. Uh, I'm now on the buy side again at uh, Internet Brands where I'm basically the, the strategy guy on the M&A team. Uh, so I work with the CEO and the uh, general counsel who is whip smart at, uh, at acquisition execution. Um, and they've been running this thing for 15 years, taking it through three pivots, took it public, took it private with Hellman, and then just uh, flipped it from Hellman to KKR last June. And they've built um, a diversified portfolio of, of internet properties, starting as Cars Direct, uh, now have uh, verticals in auto, health, and legal. Health and legal is mostly an SMB SaaS, you know, providing website hosting uh, and development for doctors, lawyers, dentists, chiropractors, orthodontists, veterinarians, people who are in those professions where marketing is actually part of the mix. Um, and then carrying that into other sort of customer communication management, um, scheduling, uh, you know, a whole host of additional services that you can provide to those small businesses where there's maybe, you know, two to 10 practitioners. Um, They've built a very profitable business, runs on um, roughly 45% EBITDA margin. Uh, they tend to go out and do acquisitions in this range between 10 and 30 million. Um, when you do acquisitions in that range, what you usually find is a team where there's one or two very talented people who are either really good at sales or product or technology or some mix of those three. And they've taken an interesting idea, built it out, had some success, but they're kind of running into the natural limits of what you can do with a small organization, you know, where you start getting into having to pay for space, having to pay for finance, uh, HR, um, you know, uh, legal support infrastructure, et cetera. There's some shared service stuff that works better in bigger companies, and there's some operational understanding and actually there's some uh, management of technology that you can do at a large scale that can really help these businesses. Um, we'll do probably eight to 10 acquisitions a year. Each of those acquisitions brings another three to five million of, uh, of EBITDA once we're you know, fully integrating the, the, uh, the businesses. It's a hell of a growth strategy and it, and it will work and I know J2 Global does more or less the same thing. Um, not everybody lo is in love with the management team there, but they're doing something that's very successful and similar. Uh, there's a couple of other firms that are starting to recognize that. And I think that's the other side, the buy side of this very robust market in sort of the sub $50 million space. Um, so you don't hear about this much, just wanted to kind of, you know, remind us all that it's there, it's attractive, it's a, it's a good path for a lot of people. Um, my takeaways from all this experience with uh, small businesses and exits is, it's, you know, I, I, I'm gonna start with the obvious, faster is better. And that sounds like, well, of course, you wanna get faster to, to, uh, to the payout, but really it's also about, there's another issue here that, yeah, you know, I've worked with a lot of founders who forget that not everybody else is in love with their idea, but there are other people trying to build the same idea, and it's a race, and time is not your friend. Um, the longer it takes you to get to whatever point it is that you have critical mass, marketplace acceptance, or any, any other measure, the more likely somebody's gonna come out of the weeds and knock you off. 
or the more likely something's gonna shift in the marketplace and you don't matter anymore. So fast is good. Um, fast failure is your second best option. If something's not working, move away from it. You know, I, I don't, the story I didn't tell up here was a company that I joined for three months that had really interesting uh, distributed computing platform technology, but it was in a lawsuit. And I took the job to, first, first part of the job was going to negotiate the lawsuit away. And if, that, if I'd been able to do that, I would have stayed. But um, I went to meet with the opposing party and said, these guys have been bad actors. I'm here to clean it up and fix it and get them to a position where you're happy with them. And their reaction was, can you give us the correct spelling of your name and your address? And so that's when you know, okay, yeah, I'm not joining this lawsuit. Um, that happens too. Uh, good ideas don't always win, good execution, uh, and a little luck. Um, although I always use the definition of luck, I heard from you know, a really well-known philosopher who was at Steven Seagal. <laughs> one, one of his movies, uh, you know, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. That's pretty true. Be prepared, recognize opportunity, and jump all over it. Um, I've all, it's also been a truism for me personally that you know, there are times when you're thinking less money is better, and I've now had some personal experiences where taking less money puts you under less constraints, comes with less strings negotiating harder for lower preferences, making sure, you know, for example, you don't go beyond a 1x liquidation preference and, and basically give away all of the all of the upside value and make it, you know, you, you want whoever's in the boat with you to face the same risks as you. Um, <clears throat> and another thing that seems obvious, you know, we think about selling businesses, you know, a lot of my exits personally, and I think that's true for other people I know, you didn't say, oh, I identified the perfect company to buy us. Everybody has to have ideas about who could buy you and where you might fit. That's really important. But you never really, you know, you can't say in advance, this is the company that's going to buy us. You're usually bought, uh, you're not usually sold. You start a sales process, but somebody discovers you. If you're doing good things uh, in particular, they will discover you. So you do have to think about that from the beginning. What are my exit paths, which helps you think about your relative value delivery to a customer as well as who you're competing against. Um, that's all useful to you as a business in any case. Um, and you have to recognize that you got to get to at least some level of critical mass before somebody's going to be interested in you. Um, you know, basically what people are looking for you to do is develop an idea to the point that it's de-risked enough that they can take it over without it falling apart. And the mental model seems to be a threshold roughly at 10 million in revenue or rapidly approaching. You know, like I, I looked at a company yesterday that did six million last year, is probably gonna do 11 this year. That's a nice growth trajectory. They've got a good uh, value proposition. I like their products, you know, that, that's one that's very successful. Um, when you are in the sales process, it's really important to understand why somebody's buying you, because that tells you how they value you. Are they, you know, in the case of Dev Vision, what they really valued was the scientists. They wanted the technology, they had, they knew that there were a bunch of places they would ultimately be able to uh, put that technology to work. They loved the IP portfolio. So spending a lot of time arguing about the growth trajectory of the mobile advertising business was a waste of time. You know, they were not going to value it that way. Um, if they're buying you for relationships you've got, for market share, for you know, specific talent within your organization, you need to kind of understand so you know what it is that, the, that people are valuing. Um, and, you know, I, I can't tell you how many businesses I've run into that are virtual uh, or have significant virtual talent. Offshoring can be, can be useful for a lot of businesses. I know a lot of businesses have been successful doing that. But if you're too virtual, you don't have a critical mass someplace, so you've now become a much more risky proposition. Um, and if you're in a weird location, we're here in LA, so that's not a problem, but you know, you think hard about, okay, do I really want to buy this business in Tuscaloosa? Where's the airport? How do I get there? You know, who, who am I going to be able to attract in if the founder quits or the CEO quits or the head of sales quits? You know, how, how am I going to build that business and what am I going to lose if I have to move it? 
So location does kind of matter. And I think that's why you've seen the, the growth, for other reasons as well, of, of uh, networks where people are kind of aggregated. And the last thing is I will, you know, now that I'm working back with, in Corp Dev, I will admit quite honestly to you, Corp Dev is usually not your friend. Corp Dev isn't there to figure out how to make your life better, how to help you make more money, how to make sure that every promise you've ever made to everybody in your organization is kept. They're there to figure out what's the value of your business and what would the acquiring company do with it. And so it's good to connect inside companies to the CEO or to somebody in product or somebody in sales, somebody who's gonna be a champion for, for whatever it is that you're doing. Um, I'm probably not any more of an expert on this than most of you out there, or several of you out there at least have probably had similar experiences. So at that point, I'd like to just stop talking and let you guys ask questions and maybe talk to each other. Thank you, Alex. That was a great presentation. Lots of really uh, great information. I'm gonna hand the mic to John. Uh, we've got a few minutes for Q and A. We'll probably do two or three questions. Uh, so John, uh, if you, if you raise your hand, John will find you. Please stand up, say your name, what company you are, and ask your question. Let's um, stay away from commentary, um, past successes that you've had, um, anything like that. Let's really stick to questions, okay? Thank you, John. So, uh, you just uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I wonder if you could just share your experience about valuation. So, how do you come up with that magical million dollar amount that you're going to be sold for? How accurate is it? And finally, how much would you say that design is a portion of that outcome? So, it's design 50%, 20%, 10%, 100%? How much is the design? Design. Yeah. Um, in software, you know, product really matters. And so design matters uh, uh, as well. I don't know if people consciously think about it, but they, they think about it in terms of normally of what's the user experience that I'm creating? How am I managing that user experience? How are they interacting with my product? And there's a ton of design issues there. So I, I, I don't know if I can go further than that on design, but it, it's obviously very important because product matters a lot. Um, and, um, in thinking about valuation, if you're part of a company that's owned by a private equity firm, it's very simple. You're trying to grow EBITDA. So you're always looking at companies and saying, okay, I take your assets, I move things around, I add things, I do stuff. Where do I end up in revenues? Where do I end up with costs? What kind of EBITDA is left over? And you know, can I justify that as something that adds to the value of the company that I'm in. So that's from the buyer's perspective. They're looking for accretive deals, which add value because um, the multiple that they sell for, and that's one of the things you'll want to understand. Like when I was looking at Lynn Media, I immediately look at their stock price. What are they trading at? If they're trading at uh, 15 uh, times their um, uh, cash flow, essentially, then <laughs> that tells me they're going to pay me less than 15 times, but uh, you know, they're probably looking for some number between five and 10. And if they can buy me at five, it's a home run, it, uh, you know, because they have to take risk into account that I'm not going to necessarily deliver on every promise that I, that I showed to them. Uh, that happens, believe it or not. Um, so, uh, and, and you don't quite give the same presentation to somebody trying to buy you as you would to your boss if you're presenting a budget, for example. Um, you, you'd think people would understand that, but, uh, and I only say that because Lynn Media had me do a budget presentation a week before close, and they thought I was going to give them budget numbers. Huh. Um, anyway, so um, that's really the magic for most larger companies is to think about even evaluations, but they have to pay attention to, you know, there's a market for everything. There's a market for your assets in your space. What are, what are those assets trading at? So people do, have to be aware of multiples, and sometimes multiples get bid up to ridiculous levels, but it always comes back to what's the, what's the cash that your business is ultimately gonna generate in their hands? How much of that do they have to give to you to get you to turn it over? Because they'll look at, at your business and say, in your hands, what are your expectations? And if you're gonna sell it to somebody else, what do you, what do you, you, know, what do you think you're gonna be able to get based on what their expectations for how much money they're gonna make with that business? Um, you can get companies that do stupid stuff if you're really strategic, strategically critical. 
Uh, take as an example, I'm now working in the auto space, so I'm trying to understand a company called Solera, which uh, started out as ADP claims processing um, for the collision uh, repair shop uh, business. And they acquired a company in the UK for 27 times. Like, what math makes that possible? That's just not even possible. But it was a very, for them, it was a cornerstone acquisition to get into a marketplace that they built a full range of, you know, they're focusing on trying to build a solution around the customer journey through the uh, ownership process so that you have all the tools that you need to manage uh, the asset value and risks associated with owning an automobile. Um, and for them, that was a critical market that they knew they could assemble the full set of assets for that. So they overpaid for one and then they made up for it on other ones. So, you know, it's always, there's art to it, but that's how you tend to think about it. One last question. Yeah, here. Yeah, sorry for going on so long. Mm. So assuming you've heard of the JOBS Act and the SEC rules about crowdfunding, what do you think, how, how will that affect the market, especially below 50 million? Um, well, crowdfunding is a great thing for a lot of businesses because it's going to give them access to capital that they otherwise might not have and with less onerous terms and conditions. But, um, you know, I, I, beyond that, I don't know if I can comment more because it, 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 there are people who start looking at it as dumb money and dumb money becomes smart money as soon as people start losing it. Um, so they go look at the, what the smart money people did and they'll start asking for liquidation preferences and other onerous things too. But, but it at least gets you into a market where if you have an interesting idea, you know, you can start to democratize capital a little bit. Awesome, thanks. Thanks, Alex. <laughs>